Friday, October 29th, 2021, 517 AM, room 307, Fig Boutique Hotel, Gampang Pet, Thailand. I had a very good day yesterday, despite failing on both of my goals. My first goal was for that to be my last day in Gampang Pet. I am supposed to be busy packing up and moving on to Sukhothai today, but I won't be. The way I feel right now, I actually could. I have the energy after a good night's sleep. But after my exertions of yesterday, I was tired, and I couldn't contemplate the idea of being on the road the next morning. I thought I needed at least another day and a night in Gambang Pet to recover and get organized. So as I rode around town, I dropped by the Paradise Resort Hotel, and I was so pleased by what I saw and by the price that I decided to move there and therefore stay in town longer. I'll probably stay there at least two nights. Three, more likely. I love the way the place was laid out. When you arrive, you ride your scooter into a large open area and there are rows of rooms, like motel rooms on the right, and then a big area of similar rooms and perhaps separate bungalows towards the back. It felt casual and free and welcoming. As I was getting off my scooter, taking off my helmet, and trying to wrestle my lengthening hair under control, a woman inside the office called out a greeting to me through an open window. I loved that. I felt at home. The rooms seemed to have a standard price of 350 baht per night. That's $10.50 US right now. And that is as cheap as rooms get in Thailand. They had a sign out by the street saying that their rooms cost 350 baht, and I was pleased when that turned out to be the truth. No bait and switch at the Paradise Resort. And I'm sure that the room will turn out to have issues. I remember reading that the mattresses are rock hard, and this is an older place, so furniture and bed sheets and pillows and appliances will likely be a bit rough around the edges, if they work at all. But I'm used to that. But the room they showed me was actually quite large. It was every bit as expansive as this room at the Fig and my room at the Soho. I think they even serve a type of simple breakfast in the morning. My other failed goal for yesterday was to shoot a whole bunch of short videos about a variety of places in Gampang Pet. I fell far, far short of that goal. I went first to the Ket Nai section of the historical park. I intended to shoot a video there and then shoot a video at the nearby Thai House Museum and then do a tour of the city walls and then visit the temple across the river and even go to the banana market. In the end, I kind of accomplished two of those. I had a very good experience at the historical park. The only issue was that the sun was out in full force for much of my visit and it exhausted me. I also had a funny experience where I lost a very important piece of my GoPro three-way grip. At least I thought I lost it. I walked all the way out of the park, a pretty long, hot walk, and just as I arrived at my scooter and started to put away my camera gear, I noticed that the main screw holding the whole grip together was missing. At some point on my visit, it had come loose and, I assumed, fallen to the ground. I thought about what to do. Without that screw, the grip is pretty much useless, and it's an expensive and very useful device. Yet, the chances of ever finding that screw inside that vast park was slim. And I was so hot and tired by that point that the thought of retracing my entire walk through the park was not an enticing one. But I decided it was worth the effort. This screw is actually quite large, and I thought there was a chance I'd be able to spot it if it happened to fall onto a convenient spot on the trail. 
I indicated to the woman at the ticket window why I needed to go back into the park, and I think she understood, and she waved me through without asking me to buy another ticket. And then I started walking. I walked all the way to the far end of the park, retracing my steps, and I didn't see it anywhere. I was about to give it up for lost, but then I had a brainstorm. A brainstorm I probably should have had when I was still at my scooter. I wondered if this screw had worked its way loose while the grip was still inside my knapsack. Perhaps it had not fallen onto the ground at all. And this was possible because while I was in the park, I had never actually extended the arms of the grip. I'd only used it in its smallest form as a simple hand grip. That's why I didn't notice the screw was missing. If I had extended the arms, I would have noticed right away because the whole thing would have fallen into pieces. But since I'd never opened the grip up, it was possible the screw was sitting at the bottom of one of the many compartments of my knapsack. I sat down on the trail inside the park and methodically went through all the compartments where I remembered putting that grip this morning. And to my disappointment, the screw wasn't there. I was just about to pack up and continue looking on the ground when it occurred to me that there was no reason the screw had to fall out that day. Maybe it had come loose on a previous day. And on those days, the grip might have been in a different compartment of the bag. So I checked all the remaining sections as well, and I found the screw at the bottom of the very last one, the small compartment at the very front of the knapsack. I was so happy to have found it. So it turned out there was no need for me to have gone for that long second walk through the park. I could have found the screw inside my knapsack while at my scooter if I'd thought to look. But I was glad to find it regardless. I have so much technology trouble that it was nice to avoid this particular problem. After my visit to Ketnai, I rode my scooter around the old city for a while just to create a breeze and dry off the sweat on my body and cool down a bit. I would have popped into an air-conditioned cafe if there had been any in the area, but there were none. Then I went to the Thai House Museum. Unfortunately, it was closed. There was no actual sign saying that it was closed, but nor was there one saying it was open. But all the many buildings were locked up tight with all the windows and doors closed. And I saw a bunch of displays on the lower floor, but they were all covered in sheets. And I saw no one there at all. I wondered at the time if the place was ever open. After that, I found a burst of energy and I decided to follow through on my plans to circumnavigate the old city by following the path of the city walls and shoot some video. I started in the northeast corner at what they call a fortress. And from there, I rode the entire way around, stopping at various points that struck me as interesting. I had done this entire ride the other day when I did my time lapse, but this time I went much slower and I explored more and I got a lot more out of it. I'm hoping the video of this experience will be of some interest to some people. But after this experience, I was too tired to continue. If I knew for sure that I was leaving Gampang Pet the next morning, I might have forced myself to also visit the big temple across the river and the banana market, but I had already made up my mind to stay in Gampang Pet even longer, and with the thought of at least one more day to explore, I decided that my visit to the historical park and the city walls, plus a brief stop at the Shiva Shrine, was enough experience for one day. Once I made that decision, I rode to the Paradise Hotel to look at a room, and that was largely the end of my day. I was exhausted. But to go back for just a second, I should note that I very much enjoyed my visit to the inner district of the historical park. 
The woman at the ticket counter was very friendly and she engaged me in some simple chatter about where I was from. I tried to learn from her how to pronounce Ket Nye, but no matter how many times I tried to say it, along with Ket Aranyik, she didn't understand what I was asking her. I got the impression that Ket Nye meant nothing at all to her. Perhaps this name for this part of the historical park only exists online in one or two places, and the distinction between Ket Aranyik and Ket Nye is not used locally. Not to harp on the subject, but this division of the historical park still strikes me as a potential source of much confusion for visitors. Or maybe I'm just a dummy, but the big sign at the entrance and near the main road reads simply Gampeng Pet Historical Park. A casual visitor could easily conclude that this was the entire historical park and never even realize that the main park was, in fact, somewhere else entirely. I think the signage could benefit from at least a small subtitle, making a distinction between the two sections of the historical park. The English words in use are quite clear, inner district and forest district. Perhaps that could be added to the signs. Though I get the impression that there could be a better and more descriptive name for the inner district. It is clearly distinct from the forest district. There are two main sites in the inner district, Wat Pra Kau and Wat Pra That. And as I've read many times, these temples were without monastic precinct, which means that there were no living quarters for monks. Large groups of monks lived and meditated and did monk things at the temples in the forest district, but no monks actually lived at these two very large temple complexes inside the city wall itself. The temples were for ceremonies and offerings, but no monks lived there. This gives me the impression that these were a kind of royal temple or special ceremonial temple more connected to the rulers and powers of the time. A clear difference is that the temples in the forest district were outside the defensive walls of the city, while Wat Pra Kau and Wat Pra That were inside the walls and therefore protected. Perhaps that is the key distinction between them, and this inner district would, would be better named as the city wall district, or better yet, the royal district. I had three main takeaways from this inner district. First, I was struck by the size of these two temple complexes. They were both quite large in scale, perhaps much larger than any equivalent temples in the forest district. Second, I kept worrying about the very top of the various chedi. They looked just moments away from falling over or collapsing. I wondered aloud several times whether the authorities and experts were confident that these structures don't need to be reinforced. And I wondered if there was discussion around the issue in terms of preserving the past. There is clearly a desire and a need to maintain these ancient temples in good condition. You don't want them falling apart, but you also want to keep them looking in their original condition. You don't want to renovate them and change how they look. You want to keep them historically accurate. But how do you keep them historically accurate while at the same time reinforcing the structure so that they don't suddenly collapse? Or have they done that already? My third impression was of the beauty of the collection of the three Buddha images at Wat Pra Kau. I had seen pictures of them and I was looking forward to seeing them in real life. There is a serene reclining Buddha in front, and there are two companion Buddhas in a seated posture just behind, one on each side. I think it was just nice to see these three Buddha statues together, almost as friends and companions. It felt like the two Buddha statues in the back were keeping the reclining Buddha company. And that is rare, I think, 
Normally, Buddha statues are separate and individual. There might be a hundred Buddha statues in a row, but each one is clearly separate and not connected to the others. I wouldn't go so far as to say that regular Buddha statues give off an air of loneliness. They don't. But they are always alone in tone, if not in geography. It was nice to see a grouping of three Buddha statues that were clearly meant to be together as a set. Kind of like good friends having a pleasant meditation session together. After breakfast. I'm surprised at how busy this hotel is. They appear to have been close to full occupancy every night that I've been here. And the somewhat simple breakfast buffet is a beehive of activity most mornings. A lot of people are there. This morning was particularly active because it rained heavily and there was a lot of frantic moving of tables and such things in order to find shelter. Something I've noticed about rain in Southeast Asia is that if you look up at the sky and have the sense that it might rain, it will rain. It rains every time you think it might. In a place like Canada, you can look up at the sky and see dark clouds and you might remark that it looks like it is going to rain, but it may not. It usually doesn't. Only sometimes when you think it might rain does it actually rain. In Thailand, Every time you sense rain might be coming, it does arrive, and with power. It's practically a certainty. And that's what happened this morning. When I emerged in the breakfast area and started scanning for a suitable table choice, a woman that works there quickly set me straight and indicated that I should choose a table that can be pulled against the wall and underneath a roof. She pointed at the sky toward the rain clouds. On my own, I would have waited until the rain actually started to bother relocating, but this woman dragged the table under the shelter for me, and she was right. It rained, and it rained hard. It rained so hard that I had to keep inching my table and chair farther and farther underneath my shelter to avoid any kind of blowback. I ended up practically hugging the wall to try to keep my phones and maps and brochures dry. The rain annoyed me, but I also just laughed at it. After all, I had already cancelled my plans to be scootering today. In fact, I don't know that I will spend much time outside at all, except for the time it will take me to pack up and ride from here to my new home away from home, the Paradise Hotel. I'm confused about the name though. It might be P Resort. It might be P Paradise Resort Hotel. I'm not sure if the P stands for paradise or a different word altogether. Either way, I know that they have a rock hard mattress with my name on it and potentially stinky water coming out of the taps. A small hotel adventure awaits me today. Saturday, October 30th, 2021, 5.45 a.m., Room 50, P Resort Hotel, Gampang Pet, Thailand. I'm feeling more and more like a genius this morning, following my decision to stay in Gampang Pet for at least two more nights. And that is because it rained nearly all day long yesterday, and it rained hard. Any poor soul on a scooter riding from Gampeng Pet to Sukhothai or back to Tak or Mesot would have had a wet, wet day. Instead of being soaked through all day, I was warm and dry in my fabulously pink room at the P Resort Hotel. I timed my departure from the Fig Boutique Hotel to be as close to the required checkout time of noon as possible. I believe I walked out the door at 11.55. The cleaning staff had already knocked on my door once to see what the heck was going on in there. Was I leaving or not? I'd like to think that they were pleased when I finally left and they got a look inside my room. I tend to be a very inactive guest at hotels. I don't disrupt the place or make a mess, 
I also clean and organize as I go. Therefore, the room looks as neat and clean when I leave as it did when I arrived. I usually even remove all my own garbage. This should minimize the amount of work they have to do. I've had many chances to look inside rooms that other guests have just left and they often look like a party bomb has gone off inside. There was no damage deposit requirement at the FIG and I was not held prisoner at the front desk while they checked the room. I simply handed them my key card, waited a beat or two to see if there was anything we needed to deal with or talk about, and then left. On a travel day, I would normally leave my room in stages. I would first bring down my full backpack and other items that go into the helmet compartment. Simply strapping down the backpack and getting the scooter ready could take a while and make me hot and sweaty. So I would do that first without checking out. Then I would return to my room, take one last shower to be as fresh as possible, and then go back out with just my knapsack, which I had left in my room to stake my claim. This sometimes leads to confusion because they think when they see me walk by with my big backpack that I'm checking out. But I explain, however I can, that I'm not checking out just yet. I love that last visit to the room for a chance to take one more shower, use the facilities one last time, and go over the room a final time to look for any items I may have forgotten. Yesterday, however, was not a travel day, and I had no need to do any of this. I was simply riding my scooter a short distance in Gampang Pet to a new hotel. So it wouldn't matter if I was a bit hot and sweaty and in need of a bathroom by the time I finished strapping on my backpack. I would be at my new hotel and in my new room in just a few minutes anyway. I had mapped out a route to take me to the P Resort Hotel, which I've now established is the full and accurate name of this place, and that worked out perfectly. All it took was one quick U-turn at an intersection and I arrived at the small street leading to the P. In terms of the official check-in time of 2 p.m., I was dramatically early. I think it was 12.30 when I got there. However, the friendly woman at the front desk was willing to check me in and give me a room. I had my passport ready for her, and she set about the task of examining it and making photocopies with a thoroughness that would have made an immigration officer proud. I don't think she did this out of any great concern for my identity or legality. I think she just wasn't that familiar with passports and visas, and she wasn't quite confident that she knew which pages and stamps in my passport were the important ones. She compensated for that by simply examining and photocopying every page that looked vaguely important. I decided to pay for just two nights. I might end up staying longer, but there was no need to pay in advance. I can always pay for extra nights later. The room cost exactly 350 baht per night. There were no taxes or fees or hidden charges on top of that base rate, which was nice. I handed her a thousand baht note and she gave me 300 back, and that was the end of our transaction. No need to print out receipts or sign forms or do anything at all. I like that lack of formality. Comparing the Fig Boutique Hotel to the P Resort Hotel is an interesting exercise. With all the taxes included, a, a night at the Fig cost 700 baht per night. The P cost exactly half that at 350 baht. The obvious question is whether the fig is twice as good as the P. It's definitely better, even much better. Perhaps it really is twice as good, but does it matter? Are the features and qualities that make it twice as good important? Do you need them? And are the negative features at the P Resort Hotel a real problem or not? And I guess that depends a bit on your personal preferences. I don't mind the informality at the P, as well as the funkiness and oddness. 
and I like the ability to ride my scooter right up to the door. Another person might be put off by the excessive oddness of the pee and would prefer more of a modern and standard hotel experience that you get at the FIG. The facilities at the FIG were several steps above what is here at the P. The mattress, duvet, and towels were luxurious. Here at the P, everything is kind of bargain basement. There's nothing wrong with the mattress or the towel or the duvet here, but they have none of the luxurious and rich feeling of those at the FIG, or the SOHO for that matter. At the FIG and the SOHO, you get a full set of toiletries, luxury shampoo and soap, plus toothbrushes and toothpaste, plus coffee and creamer. At the SOHO, you even got a kettle and a hairdryer. Here at the P, I got one cheap little rectangular bar of hotel soap, the standard bar you see at every cheap hotel worldwide. And that's it. Not even any shampoo. Shampoo is in a plastic dispenser on the wall in the bathroom. Certainly no coffee. The furnishings at the Fig and Soho felt new and modern. Here at the P, I'm living in a world of bright pink curtains and doilies, a bit like I'm inside a grandmother's living room. And the furnishings are old and worn. The included breakfast at the Soho was great. The breakfast at the Fig was good. It's not entirely clear to me that there is a breakfast at the P. There might be but it's certain it won't be up to the standards of the others. And then there are some intangibles, such as security. Your room and belongings feel secure at the Fig and Soho. Not so much at the P. The doors and windows could be popped open by a stiff breeze, I think. There is also noise and light. My room at the Fig and the Soho were both super quiet and dark at night, both on upper floors. At the P Resort Hotel, my room is on the main floor and the doors and windows open onto the parking lot. The Fig and the Soho both had a kind of blackout curtain over the windows. The homemade pink curtains on the windows don't keep out much light. And the thin walls and more open plan of the place means that the noise of the outside world pours in. That can be a good thing, since it's interesting to feel more in touch with the outside world rather than cut off from it. But I definitely didn't sleep as well last night here at the P as I did at the Fig. I don't know what was going on out there, but there was some kind of party happening and the noise filled my room for quite a while. And you get the sound of all the vehicles driving in and out of the parking area as both staff and guests come and go in their cars and trucks and on their scooters and uh, motorcycles. You even hear the conversations of the other guests and the staff as they walk around outside your windows. You can even see their shadows through the thin curtains and your sense of privacy is reduced. Luckily, I think I'm pretty flexible. I can enjoy both types of places. I appreciate the luxury of the Fig and the Soho very much, but I also get a kick out of the quirkiness of a place like the P. A night at the P Resort Hotel comes with an amusing story you can tell later. I had vague thoughts of riding to the banana market in the afternoon after moving into this room, but the rain had other ideas. It rained heavily and often, and I gave up on any thoughts of going anywhere. The only time I left the room was to walk to a nearby restaurant where I had a somewhat strange meal of a pork steak, sausage, french fries, and buttered toast. Just like my night at the P Resort Hotel, my meal at this odd restaurant may not have been the best, but it was definitely interesting. And with that, I'm running out of thoughts for the morning. I find I'm a bit distracted from the here and now by thoughts of what is going to happen next in my life. My plan was to spend the month of November in the northern provinces as much as possible on a scooter trip. I want to finally ride around the famed Mae Hong Son Loop, but 
circumstances are a bit complicated. I still have my room at the green guest house in Mesot. I will keep that for November. Plus, I have to return to the immigration office in Mesot by November 25th to apply for what will probably be my last visa extension. I also have to get my vaccine certificate in Mesot. And then there is the second procedure to get my vaccine passport. And with all of that going on, the clock is kind of ticking on my trip to the north. And that is making me think it would be better to return to Mesot sooner rather than later. I would need to quickly regroup there and get back on the road in order to have enough time to fully enjoy the trip through the north. If I spend a week on a trip to Sukhothai right now, it might disrupt my plans for going to the north. A loop from Mesa to Mehong Son to Chiang Mai and back is a journey of at least 1,000 kilometers. Even at 100 kilometers per travel day, that would take 10 days. And I would like as many days as possible to be off the scooter and hanging out in various places. For a slow poke like me, even three weeks feels like a short amount of time for a trip like that. And the way things stand now, I'd be lucky to even have three weeks. That would be without going to Sukhothai. Of course, there is the option of going to an immigration office outside of Mesot for my final visa extension, but the thought of doing that makes me nervous. I've heard too many stories of foreigners being denied visa extensions for random and bizarre reasons at other immigration offices. I am much more confident of a positive outcome going to the immigration office in Mesot. They know me there. I think I'm going to stick to the plan of going there. I think the math is plain. Either way, I think Sukhothai will have to wait. And that's not such a bad thing. I've been so immersed in the history of Gampeng Pet that it might be a good idea to sandwich in a break from history before going to Sukhothai. I have this feeling that I will be passing through Sukhothai anyway when I leave Mesot and start to make my way towards Bangkok and wherever I end up next. By that time, the ruins of Sukhothai will feel fresh and new. Sunday, October 31st, 2021, 1.11 a.m., Room 50, P Resort Hotel, Gampeng Pet, Thailand. I spent quite a bit more time yesterday thinking about my plans for the month of November. I still haven't fully made up my mind. I can see arguments for both plans of action. In order to complete my loop through the north, I'd want to leave as early as possible on Wednesday, for example, and I'd still have to pay rent for the month of November, so I'd be paying double for each night of the month, once in Mesot for a room I wasn't using and once on the road. By delaying my departure until later, I would be saving some money. Not a lot of money, to be sure, but I could definitely spend that money on something else of more value to me. Anyway, I could go through the dozens of reasons in favor or against each plan of action, but that would be a pointless exercise. I've done too much of that in my life. I'll think it through inside my head and then do what feels right. At the moment, it feels better to postpone my northern loop trip until December. I think that's the smart move. But regardless, I still want to go back to Mesot today which is Sunday, so that I can return to the vaccination clinic on Monday morning. I don't know this for sure, but I believe the clinic is operational on Monday mornings, and there is a better chance of being able to get my vaccine certificate then. I'm not sure about Tuesday or Wednesday or any other day. It's 1 a.m. right now, so I imagine I will turn out the lights at some point and try to get a couple hours of sleep before I'm on the road. But before then, I thought I'd jot down a note or two about my activities yesterday. Or I guess I could say just activity, since I did just one thing, I went to the banana market. 
The province of Gampeng Pet is known for the quality of its bananas. They are a special type of banana, which they call an egg banana, or kluai kai. They're called egg bananas because of their small size and somewhat oval shape. Despite this, they are supposed to be tasty and very aromatic. Whatever the truth of all this, the bananas are popular, and a large banana market has grown out on the main highway, which is the central thoroughfare connecting Bangkok with Chiang Mai. Travelers stop there to stock up on bananas, banana trees, or banana snacks. This market is located about 14 kilometers outside of town, and I plotted a route there that took me down some small streets along the Ping River. That was a nice ride, and it finished up with a kilometer-long section of muddy road that was a lot of fun to navigate. I'm not sure I'd call my visit to the market a success. I was expecting a large banana market building, but instead of a central building, the market consisted of a few dozen separate shops and stalls spread along the length of the highway with the heavy traffic roaring past. And that made sense. Travelers simply pulled over to the side of the highway in front of their shop of choice, bought some bananas, and then kept driving. I rode my scooter down the entire length of the market, and then I parked there intending to walk back and take video. However, I realized that the sun would be behind me the entire time, so I decided it would be better to start from the other end. I got back on my scooter and rode to the other end of the market. I parked my scooter there, after a bit of an effort, and then got my GoPro set up and started walking along and chatting into the camera. I was kind of hoping to magically run into the one banana seller that was friendly, outgoing, and spoke English, but I never did find that magical combination. I just had to stumble and bumble my way along in my normal fashion and make the best of things. I did get lucky in that I encountered one young and very friendly sales clerk at one of the shops. She was self-confident despite speaking no English and she guided me through the process of trying out and then buying some bags of banana chips. Because of her, I ended up buying six bags of banana chips, far more than I needed or wanted. But they had a simple system of charging 35 baht per bag or 100 baht for three bags. That's how I ended up with six. It was just a nice round number costing exactly 200 baht. I found that I struggled with the documenting of the experience. The language barrier is probably the biggest problem. I'm never at my best when I can't use words to communicate. Without words, I am both helpless and awkward. The other problem is the simple mechanics of shopping while holding a camera, particularly when it is hot and loud. I found myself thinking, as I often have, that it would be an interesting experiment to hire a kind of camera person. The camera person would not have to be skilled. They just need to be a physical body holding onto the GoPro and generally pointing it in my direction as I walk around and do my thing. I keep thinking there must be a way to find a young English student that I could hire to simply walk with me for an hour through a market and take video and perhaps even translate a bit, and I could pay them for their time. The trick would be contacting such a person. My idea is that this person would be willing to do it for the money, but also for perhaps the entertainment value of hanging out with a foreigner like me and speaking a bit of English. I enjoyed my visit to the banana market, but as often happens, I did come away with the sense that it was a rushed visit and not as rich in an experience as it could have been. It was a bit of a frantic visit and I wasn't upset when it was over and I was able to get off that crazy loud highway and get back on the small streets on my scooter. My ride back into Gampang Pet just happened to take me right past Fat Boy's Burger Bar 
and I took that as a sign that I should have a final chicken burger with fries on my last day in Gampang Pet. I managed to convince the owner to accept a bag of banana chips as a present. He, in turn, tried to charge me nothing for my lunch. In fact, he really wouldn't accept any money at all. And I know it is a bit silly, but I didn't feel comfortable accepting a free lunch. The banana chips weren't worth an entire lunch, that's for sure. Plus, I was going to post a video about his restaurant and I didn't want to be in the situation of seeming to get paid in free food for a video about the place. I know that's silly. There's no reason to take one of my YouTube vlogs so seriously. But there is just the tiniest bit of ethics involved here. Whenever I watch a camera review on YouTube, the YouTuber is always careful to make it clear whether the camera company sponsored the video in any way. If Sony gives you a free camera in exchange for posting a review of it, that must affect the review in some way. How could it not? The YouTuber would feel pressured to say good things about the camera. And the same would be true if you happen to post a video about a restaurant. I wasn't really reviewing Fat Boy's Burger Bar in my video. I was just doing my usual casual account of my personal experience of eating there. But I remember saying a lot of wonderful things about the burger and fries and other food and drinks that I had there. And my opinion could be suspect if it turns out that I got all that food and drink for free. In the end, I risked offending him and I put the money down on the table and walked away. He wouldn't take it from my hand, so the only thing I could do was just put it on the table and leave it there. As always, I had big plans for getting a lot of YouTube-related things done in the late afternoon and evening, and I did get a bit done, but it wasn't nearly as much as I had hoped. I was just too tired after my banana market exertions.